So now we continue with this central story of our time. Uh, Nalafer Pazira is a reluctant movie star, a journalist, a documentary filmmaker, and a Canadian. One of the lucky ones who got out in time. Uh, Nalafer, come on up. You all know the background of this story and the horrific words that are usually associated with it. Um, uh, I, I just want to ask Nella for two questions uh, as Afghanistan continued to slip further into uh, chaos and bloodshed and then one day the Taliban imprisoned half the population of the country, the women of the country. Why did the world say nothing and for so long? Why did the world say nothing? I think that's the big question in my mind as well, as um, I try to rally around and tell people, individuals like my friend are depressed, they're suicidal, and uh, why can't you do anything? The answer was, Afghanistan? Is that in Africa? <laughs> or is it somewhere, oh, is, how come you're not as dark as the rest of Africans? That was the response. So I guess that's a good question to ask. It is. And the second question I have for you, and then I'll leave the stage to you, is uh, in the movie, uh, we tell a version of the story of your life, where you try and go back to Afghanistan and find your friend, Diana, yep. is that how you pronounce Diana. it? Yeah. Who was threatening suicide because of her hopeless condition. And uh, perhaps you can tell us what happened to Diana. Uh, to this date, I don't know what happened to her. Um, I've lost contact. Um, I'm hopeful to be able to go back and try to uh, follow the traces of the information I have um, to find her. Um, the last direct contact I had was basically indicating that she was still alive, but she had moved out of Kabul, which where she originally was. Um, so that's the update on that. But um, I wanted to sort of, first of all, say great to be here. Um, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to talk to uh, fellow Canadians and uh, people from other parts of the world. Um, I'm often referred to as, as sort of, um, I guess I hope that's a joke, an Afghan heroine, and I always turn back and say Afghan indeed, but hardly any heroine. Um, I wanted to sort of, um, put my journalistic hat on and, uh, and, and start off by saying that um, for, for reporters, um, I guess history is very important. We are ought to follow it diligently. Um, and uh, of course, for me personally, my love affair with history began very early on in my life when I was still a teenager sitting in the living room of my, my house in Kabul, my family home in Kabul, in relatively speaking peaceful times reading Oriana Falaci's uh, his interview with history and thinking about the importance of history. But of course, at the time, it was the importance of history in terms of its geopolitical impact, not in terms of personal. Um, and then many years um, here in Canada, um, especially uh, in early 90s, when I began to learn the language and sort of the new culture in Canada, um, I began to make a connection between um, you know, what his, the sort of geopolitical history of the world and how it is important to know it, but also what is personal part of that. Um, there are an aspect of it, of course, is we have mapped identities. Um, you know, I was born in a part of the world. Um, I was raised into a certain family, into a certain lifestyle, into a certain culture. Uh, what would it have been like if I was born in Canada um, or in other parts of the world? That is a part of, 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 of sort of our being, the mapped identity, that we can't really do much about. Uh, we try to raise above it, we try to leave our prejudices, learn new cultures, new languages. But still, um, that sort of shadow-like identity follows you up, as it has mine, and I haven't denied it. Um, the other part of, of, of importance of history um, is something that we can do something about. We can change it. We have a choice. We can choose. Uh, we can let history um, let us free. We learn from it. We learn lessons from it. Or we can let history imprison us. We will be stuck with an image of it. And we would lose even the very language of the struggle to, to, to free ourselves. 
And I think the two cases at hand for me, which is sort of an interesting contrast, is America and Afghanistan. Um, and um, I look at Americans. Um, I have many, many friends. I've traveled several times there. And I can see that there is such an in increasing interest, of course, in the public. Um, there is a lot of uh, in good intentions in parts of Americans. We try to do the right thing. We want to do the right thing. And a very intrinsic belief that you know, their democracy um, can be useful in terms of um, applied to other parts of the world. They would like other people to have what they have. Um, and they seem to be quite content with what they have got. Um, but also there is the administration, that there is the American foreign policies. And um, I wonder about sort of lessons of history learned when it comes to American policies, not just in regard to Afghanistan, but generally speaking in the Middle East. Um, September 11 happened, the uh, international crimes against humanity, the very wicked crimes. And um, I felt for a moment um, in that day, and I can briefly describe what I was doing, I, I sat in the living room of my home in Ottawa, holding on to my knees and crying, because when I was watching the images of the towers falling down and people running for their lives, it reminded me of a memory of a night in Kabul where the war was sort of closing down on the city. Um, this is right just before we left to flee the country. And, um, the sky was lit with, with fire. A depot nearby the airport um, had actually caught fire because of the rockets, the Katusha rockets that were sent by the Mujahideen forces at the time. Um, and um, we run to the basement, and we're all sort of sitting in the basement shaking and crying. And the biggest problem at the time, of course, was that we didn't know whether to run away from the home, would it be safer, or to stay where we were. And watching the images of, of what happened in, in New York, um, and, and the two towers reminded me of that. And, and for a minute I comforted myself by saying, but here is the moment, here is the chance that we can do something different. And, and, and maybe after all these years and after all series of mistakes made in regard to Afghanistan, for the first time, maybe there is a possibility that there would be enough pressure from the public and there would be enough of intelligence in the part of the administration, we will act differently. Or at least at the very human level, we will begin to understand other people's suffering through our own, through our own pain. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. We have continued to repeat the same mistakes in Afghanistan. Um, we, as Archer was talking earlier, we have armed the Mujahideen guerrillas. Of course, there is a very uh, um, problem of amnesia in the West, especially in the media, um, that we do refer to them as uh, you know, now the terrorists, but at one point they were the freedom fighters. Um, I'm sure you, you're very familiar with that heroic sort of image of, of the Afghans who, who uh, destroyed one of the superpowers. Um, and uh, we, we funded these guerrillas. I was in Pakistan in 1989. I arrived there believing that these were the resistance groups that I wanted very much to be affiliated with. But once I arrived in Pakistan, I realized that they had closed the doors. Women were not allowed to go out. This is in 1989. Um, they were, in, in fact, killing the women workers who, who, who sort of became employees of, uh, of the um, UN agencies and worked for them. They would be assassinated. And uh, the schools that they run, um, especially in Peshawar, um, had a strict dress code. Um, and. Uh, and, and of course, there were various factions of, of the Mujahideen forces, but the Americans were funding the, the most rigid and most intolerant of all of them without even thinking further that what will happen if the Russians are gone and Afghanistan will be in need of a new government. They never thought of that. All they cared about was their war. And I think that is something that a lot of people, even in recently talking about Afghanistan, have almost erased from their memories, that Afghanistan served as a catalyst during the Cold War. We don't want to refer to that. We would like to begin to say, well, you know, Afghanistan, a nation that has always been at war, the people were somewhat there. I don't know what's the inclination. They, are, they, are, they want to, to fight each other. And if they don't fight an outside power, then they fight amongst themselves. I think that's a very common thing that I usually get 
and pointed questions about it. Um, I don't deny the fact that yes, it's a tribal society and I will get to that in a minute. Um, but I think um, we, we try to forget that the people in Afghanistan did live in peace at one point. Maybe it was not a perfectly just society, but they did live with each other and they tolerated each other. The differences that you see are becoming the, the, the sources of some of the problems now. Um, it, was, it was accepted and tolerated. And there were a time when we could go to a picnic and we could go fishing with my family. I did that as a very young kid. Um, and I've got pictures of it and memories of it. And, and all of that has disappeared in the face of this gigantic very overpowering image of, of, of the Afghans, the violence, and, and the war. Um, and I think it happened, it was there. But of course, it was the militarization of the Mujahideen forces, which started as an indigenous movement against the Russians' occupation, that brought about arms into the country, that taught people how they can use military destructive weapons to get by and, and get and get what they want. And now it brings me to the second part of my, my sort of idea about the imprisonment by history. I believe that unfortunately for Afghans, um, maybe aside from a few of, of, of the leaders um, who have been educated abroad, most of the rest of us um, somehow have got stuck in, in that present of history because there has been so much talked about this image of the warrior culture, this idea of the Afghan pride, the idea of revenge, that we have actually come to believe that, that that's what they are and that's where we are and we can't live outside that. We can't really, because no alternative has been really presented. Um, I've come to see that Afghans become warriors because like professionals, like I go to university here, I had the opportunity to go study, become a journalist. Um, some of us have the opportunity to go study, become engineers, doctors, um, computer scientists, artists. They go to school to become warriors because there is no other alternative presented to them. And now that here is the moment where they are sick and tired, every Afghan that I talk to, are tired of fighting and they would be happy to give, put their guns down if they know that tomorrow someone is not going to kill them uh, or they don't have to use that weapon to feed themselves and their families. We're doing again the wrong thing. We are, instead of going with a full international military force and saying, look, we want to disarm the country, what we have done, in fact, is especially in the northern part of Afghanistan, we have gone and made pacts with the warlords. You know, we have gone and said, well, keep the security of this region for me, and instead, we will give your man how many, how many guns would you need, and how much more new clothes, because most of the guns that was left over of, of the Russian sort of, um, um, you know, fight from the 80s were kind of worn down, I'm sure, you must have seen a lot of uh, sort of racked tanks and, and very old weapons. Uh, but now we have rearmed um, the, the warlords. We have rearmed the um, small pockets of, of, of people who just thrive on that idea of wanting to share power. And now each one wants to control and dominate because they feel they have fought for something, so they might as well get something out of it. Um, and I think. Um, this is where the sort of the, the very paradigm of how we in the West have, have let a moment pass without learning um, a good lesson from the history and, 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 and hoping to set ourselves free from its bonds. Um, and also a moment um, for Afghanistan as well that we have been imprisoned further and further um, into an image of ourselves that is only part of us and it's not all of Afghanistan. And I think I have been sort of really finding myself talking um, out of frustration and outraged at the, at the media and, and, and I understanding it quite uh, well from its internal sort of uh, side of it that how selective and how difficult sometimes things get. But I have been absolutely outraged to, to look at the coverage of, of, of uh, of, of Afghanistan and, and most of the Middle East, to be quite frank with you. I mean, now we talk about CIA's going after Saddam Hussein. Um, no question about it, we all sort of don't want Saddam Hussein to be gone. Um, of course, he's a wicked, evil person. Uh, but what has been dropped out of the coverage is that it was Saddam Hussein in 1980s when he was fighting Iran. 
on our behalf, uh, that we were very happy with him, and he, he guessed uh, Aleppo, um, you know, and, and poisoned people there. But we don't make that connection anymore. Now he's just the evil man, like the Afghan Mujahideen at one point were all the honorable fighters, and now they are the terrorists. Um, we, we, the same thing in terms of Afghanistan. We talk about Gulbuddin Nikmatyar that Arthur was mentioning, and I open Globe and Mail, and I see a whole article about how Americans are trying to get this warlord, and um, in fact, he was not much of a warlord. He was much more of a theologian and, and, a, and a very restrict uh, religious thinker, much closer to the clergies, um, the very um, um, sort of um, right-wing clergies in Iran in terms of its thinking uh, than anyone else. Uh, but anyway, now Americans are after him, but we don't make the connection that it was the CIA who created and, and helped him. Um, so I think it's, it's that sort of amnesia in the West about the history, about the importance of making that connection. Um, and for me, of course, it all comes back to a very personal level because I happen to be not caught maybe between the two worlds, but I have become to um, see things both from as an outsider, insider. Um, you know, I'm per very much of an Afghan um, trying to understand the problems and, and the dynamics of a society that I have come from. Uh, during the shooting of the film, um, I came in contact with a group of Afghan villagers um, who um, were basically kept in such a horrible conditions that they had never known what TV was, they had never seen a film before in their life, and they were quite shocked and you know, looking with, with such a curiosity at the cameras. Um, and I began to feel very upset that, is this the culture I've come from? Um, and then I began to have a sense of sympathy that um, had I been in their position, and had I been a refugee living at the border of Iran and Afghanistan, um, I would have been one of them. And um, have any of those young kids, or especially the young girls, been given a chance that, like me, they would be me? Uh, but unfortunately, we have deprived um, a, an entire population based on our economic interests in the West, based on our political interests, uh, what we have forgotten to, to, to realize that many countries, including the Afghans' neighbors, have been fighting proxy wars inside Afghanistan. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, who is our great ally, and we never criticize them, their lifestyle and their women were not allowed to drive, are not very different from Taliban lifestyle. In fact, Taliban were following their example of, of the Wahhabi uh, sect of religion. Um, Saudis are finding an ideological war with Iran because they come from two different sects of religion, and they're fighting their war inside Afghanistan. India and Pakistan, which recently we have been hearing more about, um, have been fighting their war inside Afghanistan. And of course, the more obvious one was the Russians and the Americans that we even now we hope to forget about. Um, so I have, as I see that I don't have much more time to say, um, I, the question that I ask now is that what can we do? How can we try to go back and uh, learn something from the history? And, and, and try to come with some solutions. And I feel that, yes, we here do have a lot of power. We can do something. It's not just in terms of trying to be part of uh, an aid agency and try to support financially, which is another thing. The, the money promised to Afghanistan hasn't really arrived. The government, the current government, was trying to struggle and very hard to set up a, a national government, can't even afford to pay its own employees, uh, let alone the rebuilding of the country. Um, but I think we can be very, very um, active in terms of our way of thinking in terms of how we read and how we understand. Um, and I think um, the question is, do we really want to understand Afghanistan? Yes, we should. Do we really want to understand the Middle East? Yes, we should. Because if only what will make us feel safer in this part of the world would, would go back to understanding the despairs and the disparities and, 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 and the destitution that has brought about September 11th in the first place because a lot of Afghans you would see who fought with the Taliban. They fought with the Taliban not because they were really you know, wanting to go and kill people, they fought with them because they were devastated, they were hungry. And of course there was an ideological battle, they were brainwashed, but they were taken advantage of. So unless we really, 
really began to tackle the main issues and talk about the whys of September 11th. I don't think that it will make me feel any safer to live in this part of the world. Um, and, and unfortunately, what has happened in the Western media, the New York Times and, and the Globe and Mails and the rest of them, uh, there is a, a drop of a word about, okay, yes, we will begin to do this, or one person, maybe one film, maybe one article, and then the rest of it completely goes into a different direction. There has been a very strong attempt in trying to um, control the independent reporting. Um, people will write things that are not appropriate or considered anti-American maybe, or not enough of a sympathy, um, are, are fired for their jobs. I mean, look at the Ottawa Citizen, which is just breaking out in the news today. Um, and I think um, that is very essential because we have to have that space to ask the right questions and think critically. Um, otherwise, as I said, I'm not quite sure what the war on terrorism uh, would really accomplish. And, and for me, it's, uh, it's very essential, both as an Afghan, as a Canadian, um, to, to, to ask those critical questions. So I see that I have to uh, end my <laughs> sort of boring speech. I thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Moses. It's been a pleasure.